Hello friends, I hope you are well today. I am in the same outfit as the other day because immediately after finishing that video, I decided to just crack on and start reading uh, the first chapter of my book for you. In case you didn't see that video, um, the plan is for me to read you the first chapter, which is sort of a self-contained story uh, in itself uh, over the course of a couple of videos because it's quite a long story, it's quite a long chapter. Um, so I'm just going to start now and uh, see, see what feels like a natural place to stop, I suppose. And then over the course of the next couple of days, I'll continue reading it for you. And there will be one instalment from Thailand allow me to explain, uh, because when I was there uh, in early February, I filmed an excerpt uh, that I was I was going to put online and never got around to it. Um, so that will be one of the installments. Um, but for today, we are going to begin. Before I do, uh, this is quite exciting actually. I have in my hands the first ever physical copy of my book. That said, it is not actually a copy of my book, which doesn't make any sense to you, because it, uh, it isn't the finalised version, it's a uh, proof. So it will go out to um, book critics and journalists and uh, various other people um, to sort of just whet their appetite and to hopefully get a little bit of interest and a little bit of buzz going uh, before the actual release of the book. So, um, this doesn't have the front cover that the real book will have. What it does have is, ta-da, it's quite pretty. Um, what it does have is a series of the quotes that I was given um, by various wonderful people uh, on the front. And then on the back, um, I hope you can see that there. I'll tell you what I'll do. This is the front. Do a little focus for you. Um, this is the front cover with the quotes on. And then this is the back cover. Don't focus on my face. This is the back cover. So you can see what the actual cover will look like here. It's just a little box here. And then it's got the blurb and um, more quotes and stuff from people there and a bit of information. I will talk about the quotes in a separate video. Let's just get on with reading the book now. Um, but it is pretty cool. It's pretty cool to hold a physical copy. All the words are inside. All the words I wrote are in there. It's crazy. Um, I'm trying not to be loud because I have said that I wanted these videos to be really calm and soothing and something you can pop on at the end of the day to relax to. So I'm, I'm trying not to be loud, but I'm very excited about this. Um, okay, before I begin, you might want to make yourself a cuppa if you haven't already. Um, or, you know, get comfy, get settled, make sure you're all, uh, you're, you're ready for story time. <laughs> um, I'm so glad to have a physical copy to read from because in the, the video I made in Thailand, um, I was just reading it from my phone. It just didn't feel the same. It's nice when you're doing story time to have a physical copy. I'm gonna get myself comfy here as well. Right. I think pajamas tomorrow, maybe. Just one, one more cushion. Pajamas tomorrow and potentially uh, getting getting just seated more comfortably um is that are we we're good okay i am very nervous um it's weird to be sharing this for the very first time with so many people this wasn't the plan for the record um i was i was going to read a couple of excerpts i had never planned to read an entire chapter this way but i just feel like we could all do with chilling out and escaping into a bit of fiction right now. So here we go. Um, this video is pretty much unedited, but I will, there will be a couple jump cuts if, if I fluff a line or I fumble over something, um, I won't leave that in. I will actually um, edit that a little bit because we want this to be nice and smooth for you sitting there listening. Again, you don't have to watch this video. Uh, feel free to treat it just like a, a podcast or a, an audio book and just, um, just relax and enjoy. This chapter is called Muscle Memory. <clears throat> I can't believe I just cleared my throat like that. That was really funny, wasn't it? It was like so serious. <laughs> okay, 
sorry, sorry, I'll take it seriously now. I'm sorry. <clears throat> cup of tea? I've asked him this a hundred times before. I ask it now, casually, as though nothing has changed, as though this time is the same as all the others. But before the words have even left my mouth, I think that's the last time you'll ever ask him that question. I know it's true, too, because all this let's be friends stuff is just bullshit. Theo has no intention of being my friend. That's just something he's been saying to make it easier. Not for me, of course, but for him. He asked if we could have a break, but what he meant was a break up. He moved most of his stuff out of our apartment while I was home in Dublin, crying on my mother's sofa. He stopped loving me a long time ago, but wasn't brave enough to tell me. And so our relationship kept trundling forward like a wagon down a dirt road, with me tied to the back, like a rag doll. I imagine myself bouncing about in the dust with a stitched on smile and vacant eyes, just happy the rope was holding. The image is so morbidly funny that I have to conceal a grin. Sure, thanks, says Theo. Go fuck yourself, I think, in response to his perfectly reasonable answer to my question. This is going to be interesting. As I fill the kettle, I can sense him start to notice his surroundings. The place looks great, he says. He's not being facetious, it does. I redecorated. In the two months since he left, I've found it increasingly easy to accept that this is no longer our apartment. It is my apartment. The things that at first were comforting reminders of him have now grown alien and unwanted, which is why I want it all gone. The first thing I did was dismantle the photo wall. Dozens of pictures of us hung from rows of twine with miniature wooden pegs. My first and only attempt at being the kind of woman who was crafty around the house. As I took the pictures down and placed them in a shoebox, I wasn't quite ready to throw them away. I noted how smug we seemed in each one. Big, stupid smiles, cheeks pressed together, arms around waists. Here we were on a bridge in Rome, here at a music festival in the countryside. In one photo, we were lying half naked on a beach with the Pacific Ocean stretching out behind us. I remember how Theo splashed me with the icy water, bringing my skin out in goose pimples and making me shriek with laughter. None of the photos were recent. Most were taken early on in our relationship, when Theo would capture me in random mundane moments, snuggled up on the sofa or laughing with friends. I used to love how he would take my picture unprompted and not just on special occasions. Like this one of me on the halfpenny bridge in the snow, looking back over my shoulder at him. The last photo I took down was a Polaroid Theo took of me just a few days into what would become our four years together. In it, I'm lying in his bed, half asleep, my body tangled in his bed sheets, back exposed, one leg jutting out and a mass of auburn hair spilling out across the pillow like warm honey. He kept those sheets the ones with the big green, red and black circles on. They came with us from home to home over the years and on the night Theo left, as he stuffed some clothes into black plastic bags, he held them in his hands and wondered whether to take those sheets or a different set. He was going to stay with a friend, he said. Steve, he said. Who the fuck is Steve, I asked, but that was neither here nor there. He would just stay with Steve for a couple of weeks, he said. Get his head straight, he said. Take a little break and then maybe we could go on a holiday and reevaluate, he said. But Steve only has a blow up mattress, so I'll need to bring sheets. It struck me as odd how, in the midst of what was a seemingly out of the blue breakup one Sunday evening, Theo already knew where he was going and what the situation regarding sheets would be when he got there. And as he stood there like a child asking his mother which towel to bring to swimming practice, it dawned on me what was happening. I say that like the information came to me and stayed with me. It didn't. It was more like a gap in the clouds than a dawning, really. Just a glimmer of clarity that would soon pass, returning at random intervals and increasing in length until eventually the clouds cleared completely and my brain actually accepted that it was over. The clouds wouldn't clear for some time, but in that moment, in that gap, I said, you're leaving me, Theo. Take both fucking sets of sheets. He said nothing. He packed them both. After I'd placed the last photo in the shoebox, I stood, hands on hips, and stared for a while at the blank space I'd created. The little wooden pegs hung there, gripping onto nothing. But they didn't stay that way for long. The next day, I filled the empty space with pictures of friends and family, covering the wall in memories independent of Theo, ones that existed in a different part of my mind, a part that didn't hurt to access. When the wall was full, I looked at the remaining stacks of photos I had printed out and decided to keep going. I stuck them all over the fridge, but still there were more. So I stuck them to the kitchen cabinets too. 
I had to run to the shop to get more blue tack and by the end of the evening my entire kitchen was covered in photos. When I finished I chuckled to myself at the sheer number of pictures then realised how much like a psychopath I would seem to the casual observer and erupted into a full-blown belly laugh at my own expense. My laughter sounded odd in the empty apartment. I had a cleansing of sorts, boxing up Theo's things and removing everything that reminded me of him. I bought new bed sheets, crisp white with orange embroidery across the bottom. I got rid of the leather sofa I'd always hated and got a comfy secondhand one instead, scattering yellow cushions on it and adding a knitted throw and a brightly coloured rug. I hung new artwork everywhere and lit scented candles every night so that even the smell would be different. Everyone who comes to visit now remarks at how much cosier the place feels and I wonder why I didn't do this before. I've welcomed the onset of winter and the increasingly long evenings which provide the perfect excuse to settle into my new snug space and read all the books I've been meaning to get to. I curl up on the sofa with Nora Ephron or Joan Didion or some other former heartbreaky who's been there and done that and lived to tell the tale. Sometimes I stop to contemplate a particularly moving passage. I stare out at the bare treetops, their dark branches quivering in the breeze like skinny fingers, blindly searching for something they can't find. I relish the silence and the ability to think my thoughts and feel my feelings in peace. And when I get cold, I put the heating on, choosing to ignore Theo's voice in my head telling me to turn it off and put more clothes on instead. If anything, the place is a bit too warm. The hardest and most worthwhile change I made was to replace the framed Star Wars posters in what had been our bedroom. I first saw them in Theo's apartment, the one he lived in when we met, and after that they hung in every home we ever shared. Our mutual love for Star Wars was one of the first things we talked about, and during our honeymoon days, snuggled up in his flat, we binged the original trilogy almost every weekend. It wasn't the emotional attachment that made taking down the posters difficult though. The fact is, I was absolutely terrified that somehow this breakup would ruin Star Wars for me. The physical act of removing those pictures from what was now my bedroom felt like a tiny defeat. And while I could accept that there were songs I'd no longer be able to listen to, places I would have to avoid for a while, and even people I would never see again, the idea that it might now be difficult for me to watch Star Wars that I would forever associate those films with this shit show of a relationship. That's dumb. But I did take them down and I immediately replaced them with three new posters of three powerful women. Now, Ellen Ripley, the bride and Sarah Connor hang side by side above my bed and I sleep a little better with them there. Theo's here today to collect the rest of his stuff. The stuff he didn't shove in a black bag that first night or sneak out of the apartment when I wasn't home. But he hasn't seen the bedroom yet. I'm looking forward to that. In fact, I had to resist the urge to laugh out loud when he walked in and was met by the unmissable display of photos in the kitchen. I could see the cogs turning, his brain offering up to him the possibility that I had entirely lost it. And this, coupled with my chirpy demeanour in what I'm sure he was expecting would be a decidedly sombre scene, must be confusing him greatly. It was not my plan to confuse him, only to show him that I'm just fine without him. Any other negative feelings on his part are a bonus. I flick the switch on the kettle while Theo grapples with the new decor. I see him spot a pair of red heels by the sofa, the pair I kicked off after a night out and chose not to put away, in the hopes that he'd notice them. It's not pretty, but it's true. I wanted him to see them. I wanted him to wonder where I'd been, what kind of night I'd had, if I got drunk or flirted with anyone, maybe brought someone back here, had sex with that someone in our bed. I wanted those heels to remind him of the time I wore them for him with red lingerie. And now I wanted him to imagine me wearing them for someone else. And I wanted that thought to cut him. I haven't been with anyone else, as it happens. That night, like most nights lately, I got into bed and cried, partly from loneliness and partly from a sense of relief at having made it through another day. Truth be told, the thought of any man touching me right now feels deeply wrong. I did go on a date, but that was just an attempt to convince myself that I'm okay, which is ironic because it only served to prove that I'm very much not. The date wasn't planned as such. Last week I was having tapas with a friend when I spotted a very attractive guy at the table behind us. I was genuinely taken aback by how good looking this man was. I say man, I mean boy. He was a boy. At least to me he was. I'm 30 and I guessed he was about 23. He was having dinner with his parents, so to avoid feeling entirely predatory, I wrote my number on a napkin and asked the waiter to give it to him when I left. It was one of those fuck it moments you get in the throes of grief. An hour later, I got a text. I saved him in my phone as the guy from the tapas place. We chatted for a few days, then we went on a date. 
It was awful. Now, I'm sure people have been on much worse dates than this one. The guy from the tapas place wasn't sleazy or obnoxious or mean. He was just vapid. A beautiful, empty vessel of a man who taught me that making conversation with someone who has no ambitions in life and no real interest in anything can be quite difficult. We went to a cocktail bar in Shoreditch with a sort of 80s nostalgia vibe. The wallpaper looks like hundreds of little cassette tapes and the menus come in flimsy cassette tape holders. Novelty menus become decidedly less novel when your world is falling apart though, so all of this was lost on me. Still, we ordered cocktails and chatted as best we could for a few short, endless hours. He's a model, of course he's a model, but he's not actually that interested in modeling. He was just eager to earn some extra cash because as it turns out, working at his mate's brewery didn't pay very well. He was approached on the street one day and offered a modeling gig by an attractive older woman. Not unlike you, he said, I'll take that. When it felt like an appropriate amount of time had passed, I suggested we call in the light. The waiter came over with a bill for 60 pounds and the guy from the tapas place made no move to get his wallet out. Now, I'm usually happy to split the bill. I don't expect a man to pay the whole thing, but I definitely do expect him to not expect me to pay it just because he's gorgeous, which is what I began to sense was happening here. Also, the cocktails were 10 pounds each and he'd had four, I'd had two. So we kept talking, but now there was an elephant in the form of a bill sitting on the table in front of us. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got ourselves a good old fashioned Mexican standoff. This continued for almost an hour and was finally broken when the waiter, half bent forward in an apologetic fashion, announced that the bar would soon be closing. At this point, my date, having definitely seen the amount we owed, leaned forward, looked at the bill and inhaled sharply through his teeth. That's a lot. Yeah, I said, resisting the urge to explain how six times 10 is 60. He kept looking at it in puzzlement until finally I caved and we split the bill 50-50. As we walked towards the train station, he took my hand in his. I didn't like that. Then he put his arm around my waist and I broke, giggling uncontrollably at the ridiculously tender and overly familiar move. I assured him that everything was fine. I was just a bit tipsy, you know, from the two cocktails. But the truth is, I found this all incredibly awkward and I find awkward situations incredibly funny. I don't know why. Maybe it's a physical reaction, like how we laugh on roller coasters. Either way, I was done. I stopped and announced that I'd rather get a taxi. I said goodnight, told him I'd had fun, and I really felt like I was doing a good job of ending things there. But somehow he managed to mooch about until the car arrived, and the next thing I knew he was in it with me. We both lived in the same direction, so he suggested I drop him off on the way, and I made a big point of telling the driver there would be two stops. When we pulled up outside his house, the guy from the tapas place leaned across the back seat for what I thought was going to be a hug. It wasn't. As I put my arms half-heartedly around him, he kissed me, but given my assumption that we were hugging, the trajectory was off and his mouth caught the corner of my mouth. My entire body cringed, he probably felt it, but not one to be discouraged. He looked at me and in the most dramatically Hollywood fashion said, I can do better than that. That was it, there was no way I was getting away without kissing this fool. So I let him kiss me. I even kind of kissed him back. Nobody wants to be remembered as a bad kisser. And then it was over and he looked at me all fucking doe-eyed for a moment before finally pissing off into the night, never to be seen again. The camera died on me again. <laughs> Good timing, actually. Uh, we'll leave it there for tonight. Join me tomorrow for the next instalment of Muscle Memory. And don't forget, Out of Love is available to pre-order now. I will leave a link in the description. Sloth.